Good morning. This is the day the Lord has made. We gather to rejoice and to give thanks to God. I welcome you to worship on this eighth Sunday after Pentecost. A word of welcome to visitors and to those who are worshiping with us online this morning. It is good to be back after a week away. Looking at everything that is happening, I have to kind of center myself and um, remember. Um, following our worship this morning, we will be gathering for a conversation about worship. And that is uh, really to talk about what is meaningful you, to you in worship um, and where we might go in terms of our worship life together as we emerge from a season of very different worship in this pandemic age. So you are welcome to join us. Uh, we will begin after worship um, with ice cream floats over in the Rose Parlor. That's an added temptation. Um, and uh, I heard grape and orange, maybe not root beer, but there's ice cream and um, good conversation ahead. Also, I just want to call your attention to the announcement about uh, an opportunity to be in conversation and sharing around the topic of prayer. On Tuesday afternoons, the small group uh, will be working through this book called Learning to Pray, a guide for everyone. Um, for those um, who grew up in the church and um, have spent their lives in worship, I often hear still questions about prayer and how to pray and um, what prayer is, and so uh, we decided to tackle that, that subject. It sounds to me, based on notes I received uh, coming back from my time away, that there may be enough interest to have a Thursday morning group uh, that would meet here at the church to work through this book, Learning to Pray. So. Um, Note the dates in the, in the bulletin and watch for further announcements if you're interested. Today in our appointed scripture readings, we hear for the third or fourth time this year the wonderful words of the 23rd Psalm. And so as we worship this morning, we give thanks that the Lord is our shepherd and that the Lord desires to offer us rest and renewal and the nourishment we need, and we center our, our worship in him, our shepherd, as we gather this morning. We begin with the order for confession and forgiveness printed in your bulletin. Please rise as you are able. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God who creates, redeems, and sustains us and all of creation. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of word and sacrament in the Church of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Let us pray. O oh God, powerful and compassionate, you shepherd your people, faithfully feeding and protecting us. Heal each of us and make us a whole people that we may embody the justice and peace of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. First reading is from Ephesians chapter 2. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace. In his flesh, he has made both groups into one and has broken down the dividing wall, that is, the hostility between us. He has abolished the law with its commandments and ordinances that he might create in himself one new humanity in place of the two, thus making peace, and might reconcile both groups to God in one body through the cross, thus putting to death that hostility through it. So he came and proclaimed peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him, both of us have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are citizens with the saints and also members of the household of God, built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. In him, the whole structure is joined together and grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are built together spiritually into a dwelling place for God. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And we'll read responsively Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. The Lord makes me like a man in green pastures, and leads me beside still waters. You restore my soul, O Lord, and guide me along right pathways for your name's sake. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, and my cup is running over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the sixth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. The apostles gathered around Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. He said to them, Come away to a deserted place all by yourselves and rest a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in the boat to a deserted place by themselves. Now many saw them going and recognized them, and they hurried there on foot from all the towns and arrived ahead of them. As he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd, and he began to teach them many things. When they had crossed over, they came to land at Gennesaret and moored the boat. When they got out of the boat, people at once recognized him and rushed about that whole region and began to bring the sick on mats to wherever they heard he was. And wherever he went, into villages or cities or farms, 
They laid the sick in the marketplaces and begged him that they might touch even the fringe of his cloak. And all who touched it were healed. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Grace to you and peace from God our Creator and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Our gospel today opens with the wonderful image of the apostles gathered around Jesus. You can imagine that, right? As the story from Mark unfolds, Jesus' disciples have just returned from their first missionary journeys. They had been sent out to preach and teach and heal. They have become apostles, literally those who are sent. And in today's reading, they are eager to tell their stories. This image of gathering around Jesus communicates a sense of homecoming, of connecting, and of belonging. Gathering around Jesus is what we do as a church. We gather around him and orient our lives to him. Today's entire gospel reflects this idea of gathering around Jesus. And as I read the stories, this gathering is marked by at least three essential dynamics. When we gather around Jesus, there is blessing, there is compassion, and there is mission. Blessing, compassion, and mission are also good characteristics to keep in mind when we think about what it means to be church. Consider the story as we heard it. When the apostles return from their travels, Jesus welcomes them, which in itself is a blessing and so much a part of Jesus' open-hearted, open-armed way of being in the world. And Jesus says to the apostles, come away and rest Words of blessing for weary workers. A recognition that we need Sabbath. We need set-apart time in the company of loved ones and friends. When the disciples gather around Jesus, they enter into a space of blessing because Jesus offers the gifts we need to carry on. And Jesus also blesses the crowds who gather around him. He offers the blessings of his presence the blessings of welcome, the blessings of his teaching and wisdom, the blessing of healing mercy. And this, according to Mark, because Jesus has compassion for them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. That word compassion means to suffer with. So when we gather around Jesus, he suffers with us. He feels what we feel. He knows the joys and sorrows, the pains and burdens of wonders of everyday human life. Jesus never turns away from welcoming, receiving, holding in his own heart whatever we bring from the depths of despair to the highest joy. Gathering around Jesus is to know his compassion. The third characteristic of the space of gathering around Jesus is mission. Now we could put a variety of labels on Jesus' actions and his response to the people he meets. We could label in any number of ways the teaching, healing, the engagement with human life and human need that he shows us. And I am choosing the word mission. The simplest definition I would offer for the word mission today is loving action. Jesus became human and he lived among us for the sake of God's saving, life-giving mission. Jesus came to announce and to show us the kingdom of God through his words and through his loving actions. And when we gather around Jesus, he invites us to join him in this mission of faith, active in compassion and love. This past week, I was in a place where a lot of gathering was happening. I spent last week serving as a chaplain to the Lutheran community at Chautauqua Institution, which is an arts and education center in western New York. 
Every day at Chautauqua, people gathered in many and various ways. We gathered for worship, we gathered for learning, we gathered for edification, we gathered for concerts, we gathered for happy hour, we gathered for conversation. And one of the recurring themes I heard at Chautauqua this past week was how much everyone, musicians, speakers, audience, everyone really, really missed gathering in person this past year. Gathering matters. I had the chance to talk with a lot of people throughout the week, folks from all over the country and from many walks of life. Conversations with two women in particular provided food for thought. One of the women that uh, stayed at the Lutheran House was an active Roman Catholic, she told me, for 50 years. But she left the Roman Catholic Church. She was involved for a while in what I would call a New Age church and has an interest in Methodism and Buddhism and Quakerism. I would describe her as an open-hearted searcher a spiritual seeker who can't quite land in a set community of faith, although it seemed to me that she deeply wanted to belong somewhere. The second woman that I talked to is a lifelong Lutheran, and she prays and she meditates regularly. She devotes herself to being spiritually alive and engaged. She told me about her home congregation, where she had been active, where she raised her children, and how they are currently going through a process she called holy closure. For a variety of reasons, this suburban Buffalo Lutheran Church has decided to close its doors. They are selling their building, and they will be giving away over $1 million worth of their assets. As I talked with this woman, I asked her if she knew where she was going next in terms of a new home church or a new worshiping community. And she said she didn't know. And then she said that she was doubtful she would join another church. And based on everything that she had told me, I wasn't surprised by this, but it does break this pastor's heart. Both of these women are part of a broader shift that we have been seeing in our culture, a shift away from church membership. And this shift is happening in spite of strong, ongoing beliefs in God and strong interest in spiritual matters. This shift from church involvement and worship attendance has now been accelerated by the pandemic. Surveys and statistics suggests that 10% or more of people who had been active in church life will not be returning to worship once the pandemic ends. Now, I don't think there is one definitive reason for this trend, but a variety of dynamics at work, which also means that there can be no singular response, no prescriptive fix or way to interrupt the trend. But in thinking about my conversation with these two women, in pondering their movement, reflecting a broader movement away from the institutional church, I wonder if God is calling us to imagine and to live out new ways of being the church. I wonder if God is calling us to remember that the church is more than what happens in this building that in fact the church is wherever, whenever, there is blessing, compassion, and loving action in Jesus' name. What if God is calling us to learn how to recognize Jesus in unlikely, out-of-the-way places as the crowds long ago recognized Jesus? And what if God is calling us to name Jesus with us and to gather around him wherever he shows up. Could it be that God is calling us in this pandemic season to expand our sense of church 
beyond the building, beyond our traditions, beyond the institution. In responding to the women I talked to last week and to so many we know who have left the church behind, might God be calling us to imagine new ways of gathering around Jesus, new ways of offering blessing, new ways of sharing compassion, new ways of gathering to express our faith active in love. Even now, people are gathering for dinner church and pub church and parking lot church and rail to trail church. If church is simply gathering around Jesus, then daily life is filled with opportunities to do just that. Opportunities to gather and to offer blessing, to offer compassion, and to offer loving action in Jesus' name. An interesting thing happens, and it's not too surprising in today's gospel. Jesus sets out with his disciples to that deserted place. They're going for rest and renewal. And guess what? They are interrupted on the way. There is such a lesson here. When we gather around Jesus, anything can happen. When we gather around Jesus, his agenda of compassion and love takes precedence over our own agendas. When we orient our lives to Jesus' life, we should be ready to expect the unexpected. When we gather around Jesus, we should know that things may not go according to our plans. For the church today, this is an important word. What we envision for the future may not be what Jesus envisions. Who we think we are and what we think we need may not be what Jesus has in mind. The disciples aimed for a deserted place. But on the way to that place, Jesus saw a great crowd and he had compassion for them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So gathering around Jesus means learning to shift gears, adapting in the face of human need, learning with Jesus how to care for one another and how to share God's love with friends and strangers alike. Orienting our lives to Jesus means risking the prospect of change for the sake of the gospel, trusting that our mission is ultimately in God's hands. In our first reading from the letter to the Ephesians, Paul reflects on what this very thing meant for the early Christians to gather around Jesus. In Ephesians 2, Paul reminds us that in the first century, the church didn't look at all like the disciples had originally expected. Where the original apostles envisioned a like-minded community of Jesus' followers, this in the Jewish tradition, God's plans were quite different altogether. God remembered those who were far off. God had compassion for the lost and the lonely. God reached out in Jesus Christ to all who were like sheep without a shepherd. And that meant that God called Jews and Gentiles, slaves and free, male and female, young and old, all to gather around Jesus. God broke down ancient dividing walls, and God gathered an extraordinarily diverse and abundantly gifted community around Jesus. 2,000 years ago, God's vision for the church was bigger than anyone's original vision which meant that the apostles had to let go of their ideas and their old ways of doing things and discover new ways to be that community of Christ's people. Paul's experience in the early church teaches us that God calls us to be creative and flexible, to embrace the hard work that comes with difference, and ultimately to be dependent on the winds and the wisdom of the Holy Spirit. What I know is this. God's vision for us today is bigger than our fears that the church is not what it used to be. God's plans are bigger than our limited understanding. When we gather around Jesus, he invites us to experience the fresh winds of the Spirit 
and he invites us to trust him to lead us in right paths for his name's sake. The Lord is our shepherd, which means that the Lord is in control and we are not. The Lord is our shepherd, source of blessing and compassion. The Lord is our shepherd who calls us to loving action. And in the end, no matter what else we might say, our mission is Jesus' mission of blessing, compassion, and love in action. Our church is God's church, and our future is God's future. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow us as God promises, and the only thing we need to do is to gather around Jesus with hope and faith. Amen. the darkness of our earthbound way and show your grace. Your plan for us unveiling and guide our footsteps to the perfect day. From days of old through blind and willful ages. Though we rebelled, you gently sought again and spoke through saints, apostles, prophets, sages who wrote with eager or reluctant pen. Responding to the word proclaimed, we confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
join me in a prayer for the offerings of our lives. God of goodness and growth, all creation is yours and your faithfulness is sure. Receive the gifts we bring and nourish us to proclaim your abiding love in our communities and in the world. Through Jesus Christ, our strength and our song. Gathered around Jesus, sustained by the Holy Spirit, let us join our hearts and voices in prayer for one another, for our communities, and for a world in need of good news. Responding, hear us, O God, your mercy is great. O God, our shepherd, the church calls out for your care. Form bishops and leaders into courageous shepherds who guide the flocks of the baptized Bless your people as they seek to be faithful gathered around you. When and where the pandemic recedes, renew the worship, life, and revive the church in mission. Where throughout the world the pandemic rages, uphold your people with the strength of your word. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. The lands and waters call out for renewal, creating God. Provide green pastures and still waters for livestock. Protect gardens, farms, and ranches from disaster. Where flood or drought, wind or fire threaten, protect and preserve your creation with your loving might. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Reconcile the nations, sovereign Lord. Break down the dividing walls that make us strangers to one another and unite us as one human family. Pour out your mercy and your righteous spirit upon Haiti and Ethiopia, Afghanistan, Cuba, wherever despair seems stronger than hope. Equip leaders to deal wisely as good shepherds and teach us all your ways of peace. Hear us, O God, your, your mercy, mercy is great. Embrace all who are lonely or abandoned. Look with compassion on immigrants, refugees, those in exile, all who are afraid or lost. Give rest to the weary, comfort to those who are grieving, strength and recovery to those who are ill. Today we lift up in prayer before you those on our prayer list, especially Diane and David, and others we name aloud and in our hearts before you now. Hear us, O oh God, your, your mercy, mercy is great. great. We pray for the safety of the athletes and those who gather for the Olympics. Grant a spirit of friendship amidst competition. Protect those who are hosting and helping from COVID contagion. Hear us, O oh God, your, your mercy, mercy is great. Each of us praises you, O oh loving God, for untold goodness and endless mercy. In our own ways, we reach out to Christ to touch the fringe of his cloak. Hear us now as we lift up our own personal prayers. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. Into your hands, almighty and merciful God, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your gift of life through Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give, give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Please stand as you are able to receive the blessing.
You are what God made you to be, created in Christ Jesus for good works, chosen as holy and beloved, freed to serve your neighbor. May God bless you and keep you, that you may be a blessing. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. In peace, serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.